I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Yeah, Ray's floor is fun. And by fun, I mean I hate it. Now, the, the difference between you and I is I've had to crawl underneath the Ray's floor. And that's gross. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> yeah. It's almost a guarantee that every time I go under the raised floor, I'm going to get at least a little sick. No. Oh. <laughs> Just germs from the 70s. <laughs> Probably. For all I know. Oh. Those buildings are old. I believe it. Probably under there, nothing's labeled. <laughs> nothing's tidy. <laughs> so, fun story. Yeah. Um... Sometimes when they're tearing down a cluster, they'll just cut the cables and drop them in underneath it and just oh. say we're done. That has happened on more than one occasion. <laughs> they uh they're they're taking down some buildings at work to make room for to to put different buildings there. Mm-hmm. And they were just sort of tearing stuff out of the walls and they tore the fiber cable and they just tore it in half. So like everything that was connected to it <laughs> just fucking died (laughs) that's an expensive mistake yeah (laughs) so i went downstairs yeah and as i was going downstairs uh lissa was playing dark cloud 2 yes so i stop i say hi Uh and then she advances the, the screen to the next screen and it cuts to a clown mostly naked (laughs) <laughs> with dynamite strapped to his body. I don't know how to describe how it made me feel other than extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Mime is done with your shit. Mr. Mime yeah. is done with it. Oh, man. Have you seen the second trailer for Detective Pikachu yet? No. Is it the worst? It's so good. I want to oh. see that movie so bad. I don't know why, but it just resonates with me on a level that I can't adequately described <laughs> and mr mime gives me joy yeah that, in his oh, nightmare man. his nightmare fuel creation form that's so. i'm happy we're getting a movie theater back uh <laughs> so so I'll, I'll be able to see that without driving <laughs> <laughs> although that's a really that seems like it's going to be a really nice movie theater so i might actually go to that movie theater more often than the one <laughs> <closer to me. laughs> well because it looks like they're actually putting like a good movie theater in there that uh i i, I read this is going to sound super boring but i read good things about the chairs <laughs> i did too no 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 i will never in a million years say that good movie theater chairs are boring <laughs> the chairs that were in that theater before were practically war crimes. They were bad. These new ones, I think they recline. The the guy said. I think it. They and I like that their their goal for opening is the Avengers movie. Oh, so that's. They don't want to miss whatever that date is. Yeah, because that's a big date. Yeah. Uh, April twenty sixth. Yeah, so hopefully it'll be good, um, and then I'll get to do, I don't know, I think I might try to go see, like, movies on a weekday alone, because I feel like that's when there will be the least other people. Yeah, that's probably fair. <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck is this? You know what the fuck that is. That you just sent me Will Smith as a djinn. Right, he's not a djinn. He's genie. That's a very yeah. important plot point from uh, the documentary that is, um, I believe, was it Shazam? Was the one that had uh, had Shaq as a genie? Oh, see, this is Kazam. Kazam. Sorry. Yeah. 
That'd be very different if Shaq was Shazam. <laughs> I'd watch that. Oh, I'd watch man. that. That would be a very enjoyable film for me. Also, I was looking up which movie it was, the, what the movie title was, and uh, I found that image. <laughs> what is this? Oh, come on. <laughs> it's uh, it's the scene of Shaq in the uh, uh, the, the shower. Yeah. He was it's just on uh, Hot Ones. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the chicken wing interview eating uh, <clears throat> show. His goal was to not make any uh, uh, faces. I think he failed. He did fail towards the end, yes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so... This is uh, the uh, Shaquille O'Neal fan cast um, where we talk about all of Shaq's greatest uh, achievements than being Dr. Kazam. Shaq. That is Dr. Shaq. Um, the version of Space Jam that he was not in. Um, we also talk about the, the, the Shaq Boo video game a lot. Yep, yep. Um, we talk about his commercials. Um... We don't talk about his basketball career, though. No, no. Whatever you do, we cannot discuss that. No, that's that's off limits. That's the only thing about Shaquille O'Neal we can't talk about. Yeah. Literally everything else, that's fine. But <laughs> nothing about his basketball career. Uh, but really, <laughs> we're Cryptopedia, and we talk about uh, supernatural, spooky, weird stuff. I guess weird. Weird stuff is probably a good way to put it. I, I know that I wrote, like, some copy that, like, actually sounded pretty good, but I always... <laughs> I, I refuse to read that. So, um... Mm. There's that. Um... So this week's cryptid, Brandon. Well... Yes. It's not so much a cryptid as an urban legend, and you're in it already, so you're not going to be able to guess it. <laughs> uh, it was first sighted in 1970. It's a humanoid, and it's from North America. So why why don't you uh, read off the name of the cryptid because you uh, you broke the little game? <laughs> I didn't. I was already in the broadcasted folder and I was like, "Huh, I don't remember this one." And then I opened it and I went, "Oh, that's today's." Yep. <laughs> it is the Fairfax Bunny Man. That is correct. So, uh, what do you know about the Bunny Man? I here's the thing. I don't know anything about Bunny Man other than there's a thing called Bunny Man Bridge. And mm -hmm. um, my first thought goes to, I just read that, too, in the thing, Donnie Darko. Yep, uh, and we're not going to talk at all about Donnie Darko, because it's not that I hate the movie. It's that I hate talking about the movie. <laughs> um, that's, that's fair. I've never seen the movie. You've I've never probably seen it? Will, I will probably never see Donnie Darko, because I ha I got into an argument with someone once about time travel oh no and they were using the donnie darko model of time travel which makes literally no sense um the, the do you still have you did the timeline of back to the future <laughs> what do you think i am some kind of person who doesn't save his back to the future timeline because <laughs> i've got it I've got it right here. Oh, I've got man. I've got thirteen. I had thirteen iterations of this timeline while I tried to think about it. <laughs> I spent I spent a lot of time on this idea, a lot. <laughs> oh no, oh, a no. lot of time. There oh. are multiple timelines. That's all I'm gonna say. Back to the Future: A Study of Parallel Temporal Reality. <laughs> that is the title of this document. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. man. I, I tracked the original Doc Brown. I tracked Marty. I tracked um uh I forget what red stood for. Oh shoot, I lost Oh wait, no. So basically the way that I did it was each of the characters was represented by a different type of dotted line. And I tracked Marty, Biff, and uh and Doc Brown through the timelines, and it gets kind of complicated. There's at least six different realities that occur in Back to the Future. <laughs> um, That's fantastic. 
Yeah, I put a lot of time in that. Yeah, I can tell. I, I mean, you yeah. should share this to the to the Facebook group when this episode. Should drops. I? <laughs> should yeah. I? I think you should. Okay. I think well, people with the that would appreciate the. Uh, this this the is the first story. iteration of it. I don't know what the difference between the two is. Oh, because I left out a node in the timeline, <laughs> and that was that was unforgivable. Oh, I also did some like restructuring and made it a little more readable, and you know it's not readable, but you know whatever. So, anywho, <laughs> uh, man, I oh I close my copy. I've gotten into some arguments about time travel, so we're not going to talk about Donnie Darko. No, do you want to talk about the Back to the Future timeline instead? I might, but that's that's another episode. <laughs> I also had to rewatch the movie. Um, and I, now notice I said movie. This is important. I almost said plural. Because to me, all three of the movies are a single movie that must be watched at once. Okay. It is a six hour movie in my mind. <laughs> and it is the greatest movie of our generation in all generations. Mm -hmm. That is all. <laughs> so let's actually get to the bunny man. So the Bunny Man, while not a cryptid in the traditional sense of cryptopedia, it is featured on the cryptids wiki, so I'm allowed to cover it. <laughs> is that is that our uh, that's our, my our rule? Bar? That's my <laughs> rule. Um, it's also poorly covered on the cryptids wiki because it like jumps around between multiple like views of it. So yeah. Anywho, um, this the Bunny Man is an entity in the shape of a humanoid rabbit. Sometimes. Uh, it's rumored, rumored to menace or even kill uns unsuspecting trespassers in domain, which as I read that and having read the – done actually the actual research, I wrote that from the five-second Wikipedia article. Not 100% correct um, <laughs> because most people know that they're going to be killed by the bunny man if they're in, the bunny, if they, if they're in a situation where the bunny man can kill them. Um, yeah, I've only ever heard of them killing, not not menacing. But, but well, I, I like the menacing idea where, like, you see this human rabbit, you go to take your next step, and you fall because what's this? It tied your shoelaces together. That would be a very innocuous version of the uh, the bunny man. It would um, be. Also, I do want to put a content warning at the top of this episode because there is some uh, fairly violent acts described in the yeah. uh, the notion of how the bunny man functions. Okay. Because this is, in fact, an urban legend. It's not a cryptid in the traditional sense, although it might be a ghost story. So there's that, too. Um, Does that mean someone died dressed as a bunny? No, but I'll get... We'll, we'll get into one version of the story. Okay. Yeah. So due to its status as an urban legend, the description was left purposely vague. As behavior and appearance related to the Bunny Man varies depending on the version of the story told, and I think that there's actually multiple Bunny Men, but we're mainly going to focus on uh, the Bunny Man myth that originated in Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, I knew someone the, who was jumped into the Bunny Men. It is a weird that was, gang. Uh, that's a weird gang. Yeah. They eat carrots a lot, which I guess they have good vision, but that's not, they don't really have good vision because that was just the thing that the British government did to cover up radar. So. <laughs> yeah. So if you think that eating carrots makes your vision better, it's just going to eventually make you turn orange. Yeah, I, I want to have, have sat in on that meeting. Like how are we going to hide this new technology? I got it, boss radar. I mean, carrots. That's how, how it goes. See, uh, what's his name? Peter rabbit was in the meeting room. He was like carrots. <laughs> Colonel Bugs was like, "I have it, Doc." Carrots. <laughs> and Daffy Duck was there, like, "What are you talking about, you madman? They'll never believe it." <laughs> this was before he got his characteristic voice. Yeah. Um, chemical warfare in the World Wars was not anything to joke about. Well, World War One. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that. So. Uh, before we delve deep into the Bunny Man, however, I want to acknowledge my primary source. Okay. Um, so, The Bunny Man Unmasked is an article by Fairfax County 
public librarian and historian archivist uh, Brian A. Conway. Um, it's an over eight year investigation into the funny man. Whoa! Now keep in mind this is not just like he he wasn't working on this as his only thing for eight years. He's an archivist, right? Uh huh. So it's one of those things he would work on this periodically. Periodically um, over eight years, yeah. And I'm not going to pretend that my research in the span of two weeks would have even come close to the level of depth that this man reached. I don't like the bridge in this picture. That is that is the Bunny Man Bridge. It's, but if you look at the number of bricks on the right side mm-hmm. that adorn the arch, and then on the left side, it's not uniform. Yeah, I think I think that's because it's not uniform. I don't like that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's I mean, the that's... worst part of this whole story so far. <laughs> Asymmetric bridge. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> um <laughs> I forget what I was going to say because you just <laughs> you have derailed my my train of thought. I was going to add a little <laughs> bit more to that. Um but I do want to also acknowledge, like, this is kind of what I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, where I said that librarians are a great resource. Yeah. Because they do stuff like this sometimes. I mean, this guy is a historian slash archivist yeah. for the county public library, but that does that usually is where those types of people work in public libraries. So, so the... Um, the most infamous sto- version of the story and probably mm-hmm. the most famous version of this story that's available today um, is the Clifton Bunny Man. Uh, it's a really, really classic internet urban legend. I remember reading this back when mm-hmm. it was new. Um, it was written in the times before Slash X, the Something Awesome for- forms, and even Ted the Caver, which was a 2001 story. I don't know if you remember Ted the Caver. I don't know. What was Ted the Caver? So Ted the Caver was like this guy's personal website. Okay. And it was effectively a long form story that is kind of in the style of um, our no sleep. Right? Okay. So if you check out Ted the Caver, which I might add as a, if I remember, I'll add it as a link in the, the show notes. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was an angel fire website. Oh, okay. So... This is the original website, I think. Yeah, it's the... Oh, um, oh what's this? I don't like that pop-up. <laughs> but it's basically his... Uh... Oh, there is a pop-up. I didn't realize that. Uh, so maybe I won't... Maybe I won't <laughs> link that in the show notes. Um, but the idea is... A guy goes caving. He finds something. And uh, it gets a lot more as time goes on apparently there was even a movie adaptation of it but i never heard of it which makes me wonder um it might have been like one of those fan films or or what have you where it's a not necessarily a production company but a group of people that got together and made something yeah it's possible um oh boy so basically the long and short of it is this is like a proto creepypasta so to speak which is me kind of giving away my end conclusion about the story, but it gets really obvious within like the first paragraph. So yeah, well, I'm just I'm letting you know, and we're going to go through the story, and we're gonna take a skeptical lens to it, and we're gonna have fun with it. Okay. So uh, the original story is cre- credited to Timothy C. Forbes on thecastleofspirits.com. Um, it's fairly unlikely that this is the actual name of the author. Author. So let's just assume it's not him, but for the sake of describing it, we're going to call him Forbes. Okay. What follows is a slightly abridged version of the story because there's a lot of good juicy details in here that I want to read. Mm -hmm. The tale of the bunny man goes back many, many years. Originally, it didn't start until 1931, after many murders had already been committed. For verification of the story, you can visit the Old Clifton Library located in Clifton, Northern Virginia, USA. What am I about to tell you is entirely true. Although I've never seen the Bunny Man, everyone in Clifton believes it to be true. Huh. Mm -hmm. Is there an old Clifton library? Yeah, let's get into that. So... is Because that's the first thing, is to to make things seem plausible, you'll list a place 
within a state or, you know, if you're in another country or wherever, yep. like a province. <coughs> so it'll be a real place, but the area where you'd go to verify that doesn't exist. Yeah. That makes it seem more plausible because not everybody's going to, going to, they'll go, oh, I've heard of Clif- Clifton before. So they go, there must be an old library there. So the, you're on, uh, you're, you're definitely on the right train of thought. Okay. So there's three alarm bells in the opening paragraph. One. The time frame is vaguely specific. The author says that it goes back many years, follows up with the date, and then closes by saying that things happened before the date that he provided. Um, It might be poor writing, but it also might be an intentional attempt to mislead the reader and place them into a state of, like, uh, suspended disbelief almost. Yeah. Um, Additionally, the writer makes a point of asking you to verify the story. You can visit a location that you may not be able to access with no real citations. He takes the burden of proof off himself. Um, additionally, the old Clifton Library does not exist. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, there's it never question. existed. It never existed. You're right, you're right. Uh, and that's that's coming from uh, Cloney, the guy who wrote the article. Cloney, yeah. he looked it up, and it literally didn't exist. So it's an auspicious – oh, and actually there's one other thing. Uh, the author reinforces that the following is truth and claims the entire town of Clifton believes it, which is uh, only Sith deal in absolute. <laughs> also only Jedi. And Kelvin. The, and Kelvin. Um, Biotech universe. Um. What else? Uh, is it the absolute vodka deals and absolutes? Um, absolute units. I'm just naming off things that, that involve absolute. absolute. Also, absolute vodka, American company. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, so it's an auspicious start, but given that this post is from uh, roughly 1999, I'll give the author some credit as the art form of writing creepy, uh, convincing creepy pasta was non-existent. <laughs> uh the first like really believable creepypasta was ted the caver in my opinion mm-hmm. and even that one once it got like super duper hooey it lost a lot of credibility so the author then follows up with a brief description of the bridge that the bunny man haunts because it's weird he like he like jumps into a description before explaining what happened yeah which is really like really confusing um it was a one lane car road passing underneath a dual railroad track above it within the woods along a gravel road um the bridge in question is the colchester bridge which as a result of this legend has a prominent police presence every halloween oh. uh, especially since 2003 Ooh, that was a voice uh especially <laughs> since 2003 um I think I remember reading in the Wikipedia entry for this that mm-hmm. there was like a uh, like, like a twelve hour line of car traffic no. to get to Bunny fourteen hour traffic checkpoint into the area. Oh wow! In Halloween twenty eleven, that's yeah. the worst. It like it sucks for the people that live there, right? Because it's yeah, like you don't have the option to to not. Also, uh, better better point. Uh, once you hear the description of this story, and once we, we get through the story, I'm concerned about the people who think that this is a good place to go to. Oh, okay. It. So, uh, continuing the story, the readers are now primed. Right? Yeah. They're ready. They've got they got an idea. They're like, okay, this is what happened. This is what the area looks like. Um, so, let's uh, let's give a brief description of the asylum. Uh, back in 1903, deep in Clifton, there used to be an asylum buried deep within the wilderness of Clifton. A new asylum was built, which is now known as Lorton Prison, and a temporary facility a temporary facility until convicts are appropriately sentenced. So um, basically the idea of it is the local populace was upset that there was an asylum in the wilderness. They closed the asylum down. They opened a new one. They call it Lorton Prison. It's around 1903, right? Okay. Supposedly the town only had like 300 people in it too, so that's that's another it's thing. A small but, town. Yeah. So in 1904, this prison would have a prisoner escape after an incident accident involving the prisoner transfer bus. 
Um, most of the con- which I also don't know how they were transferring these prisoners because I don't mm-hmm. know if a tr- prison transfer bus really existed in 1903 unless it's like a, bu- a horse and buggy. So in 1903, maybe I, I don't know because because I don't think uh the when was the <coughs> yeah. <laughs> uh yeah so here's the thing the model t wasn't even in production until 1908 yeah so they wouldn't there would be a bus yeah so maybe it's a maybe it's yeah basically it's another it's another piece of misinformation that doesn't like uh it, it's a anachronism that doesn't fit so most of the convicts were injured but had managed to escape the bus and had fled into the night woods Later on, the next morning, a local police investigation had begun, and they began rounding up the escaped convicts. Hours turned into days, days into weeks, weeks into months. Everyone was recovered after four months, except for two people, Marcus A. Wallister and Douglas J. Griffin. During the search for both men, the police randomly found dead rabbits, half-eaten and dismembered every now and then along their search. Finally, they were to find Marcus dead himself by the Fairfax Station Bridge, now known as Bunny Man Bridge, which... I looked it up, and it's actually mm. called Culture Bridge, so that's a whole other thing. Okay. Um, in his hand, he held a man hand, a man-made hammer slash knife-like tool made with a sharp rock and a pretty sturdy branch as a handle. They thought nothing and cared not of how he died, only that he was apprehended, which he's dead, so he's mm. not really apprehended, and no longer had to worry about him. Uh, so there's I don't know if this was intentional or not, but the mm-hmm. the two individuals, Marcus A. Wallister, he yeah. he. he, he he, they they can't find him, so he's a wall, like a wall wallster. I don't know if that was an intentional thing. Oh, that might be intentional. And then Jay Griffin, it, it might be a stretch if it if it's uh, a Griff, but uh, it's possible. Like, keep in mind, this is the early. This is the, the early. This is 1999, so people think yeah. they're clever. Yeah, and um, that's totally something I would do. <laughs> like, yeah. If this an is... escaped convict get, make his initials a wall. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's yeah. definitely a that's <laughs> that's definitely a a, a shit eating grin type thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the setup for this is like the kind of urban legend that everyone's always heard of, though. Yeah. Right? Like a bunch of convicts escape and then they start to terrorize the countryside. Yada yada yada. Mm. White flight, white panic. Blah blah blah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. Oh, no, everyone's dead. Oh, there's a hook-handed man. Oh, there's yada, yada. Oh, it's the Zodiac Killer. Bah, 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 bah. There was a lot of words I just said there. And there, there a were. lot of them made no sense. I also wonder but, how he killed a rabbit with a hammer slash knife. Have like, you ever I watched... How, but, like, they're, they're quick. They're quick like a bunny. Well, you use a snare. You snare them, and then you beat them. I can't picture an escape, an escaped convict using a snare trap like why while, not while he's on the lamb why not well because that takes time it's true I, also I, also four months is a long time to just be chilling in an area oh yeah that's true like you imagine like, he'd be not there uh, yeah i if i was him i would be out of the area although then again the implication is that these escaped convicts weren't like criminals but like criminally insane type thing i got you okay so because th- that's yeah. why they use the asylum as a frame of reference so you can think about it in that context uh uh-huh. really really we're just doing uh literary analysis on a creepy pasta right now <laughs> so um i should also point out that neither marcus walster nor douglas griffin were incarcerated in lorton prison in 1904 okay do you want to know why I know it, that. I didn't look up. I didn't look up prison records, but I know this for a fact. Well, I can tell you why. Because why in 1903 that? there was a bus crash and they escaped, so they wouldn't be there in 1904. Close, but the real reason is Lorton Prison didn't exist until 1910. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, unless this particular bunny man is capable of defying the laws of causality, I doubt this story holds any water. <laughs> Um, anywho, undeterred by the laws of physics, uh, defying events, 
the author then continues, indicating that Douglas Griffin was the bunny serial killer. And by that, I mean the serial killer of rabbits. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say, is that related to is the thing with the bunnies and the dead? Okay. Yeah, that's why he acquired the moniker Bunny Man, because he was eating rabbits. Okay, so that means I'm sure you'll probably get on to when the guy in a bunny suit thing came about, like in the picture up top, but at this mm-hmm. point, he's just a guy. I imagine he's dressed in a prison uniform and he kills rabbits. Yeah. He's not like a creepo the clown in a bunny suit under that bridge that's not symmetric. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so basically what ends up happening is eventually uh um eventually what hap- eventually what ends up happening is the number of rabbit deaths, like half-eating rabbits which is weird in its own right. Yeah. Uh, but the number of half-eating rabbits that are appearing around the area like it drops off and it suddenly is gone so the implication is that he died or something along those lines okay they never found the body or maybe he left the area i i don't know um so halloween night comes around and as usual a bunch of kids had gone over to the bridge that night to drink and do whatever kids their age in the 1900s did (laughs) i love i love the writing in this story um midnight came wait a minute oh, this when was this written uh, 99 so it is it's the 1900s yes <laughs> yep i think he meant like as in the in terms of like the 1900s yeah but regardless uh, midnight came around within minutes which i have literally no idea what he was trying to say with that yeah um, and most of the kids had left. Only three of them remained at the bridge. And this is this is where we get into some of my favorite stuff. Oh, no. Right at midnight, supposedly, a bright light back from within the bridge where the kids were, and less than a couple of seconds later, they were all dead. Throat slashed with that same type of tool that was found by the other escapee, Marcus. Uh, not only were their flo- throats slashed, but all up and down their chests were long slashes gutting them. To top it off, the bunny man had hung both of the guys from one end of the bridge with a rope around their neck, hanging the overpass with their legs dangling in front of the pass of cars. The, the women were hang- <sighs> the women were hung, hanged in the same way on the other side of the bridge. This happened on Halloween in 1905. After that, they didn't see or hear anything from him for another year. The writing style has changed significantly. In yes. that portion. Yes. It, 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 like, he's one, I appreciate you saying hanged instead of hung because that's yes. the correct way. Um, the But the writing style, like, changed where at first, like, if you didn't read any of, like, Google the date of when the prison showed up, if you're reading it, you'd say, okay, this is a guy telling a story that, that, that makes sense. And then all of a sudden, that changes to, like, uh... uh it, God, it's like, incomprehensible like with my bare hands style writing. Oh, it, it totally it totally turns into a Shank Daddy X story. Yeah, like it, it's like a, a switch flips, and the level of writing that this person has, it they have a sharp decline in the quality of their writing. Yeah, um, like a sharp drop because it goes from like something that that appearing to give context, and it's you know it's. Marcus A. Wallister, Douglas J. Griffin, four <laughs> months, 1903. Right, That's rattling off information, basically, to yeah. right at midnight, supposedly a black light, and he, both of the guys, like, there's no names or anything. Uh-huh. Like, there's it, it's literally nothing. So, it, it gets bad. Also, in a town of 300 people, this is one, uh, what is it, one one-hundredth, one percent of the population dying in a single night. Yeah. Um, also... This is one of my favorite tropes in urban legends. Because everyone involved with the story is dead. But yeah. <laughs> we know precise details about how the, the death went down. There's a bright light, seconds to die, etc., etc. And the author is careful to couch the story as supposedly to allow the specifics to be hand-waved away. Yeah. Because, like, true. like, if everyone's dead, how 
how how do we know there was a light? Yes. Uh, it, it's it's that stereotypical like um campfire story where you know like it's every movie where someone's telling a story and then it cuts out and then there's like that one person who's like the intelligent one or like the goth or the yeah. you know you know you know the archetype who's yeah. like well if everyone died how did they know the story happened <laughs> like there's something so I want to say 90s about it. Yeah. Like, I remember having these types of stories pop up more often than 90s because maybe because I was a kid during the 90s. So because we were kids, you saw this type of storytelling show up more often. Well, because... that's when Creepypasta was like really like big. It, it, and... it is. Yeah. It well, was, no, it was... that wouldn't be in the 90s. It would have been in the 2000s when it was really big. So it was taking off in the 90s. Yeah, it, in the 90s, that was back when, like, green and black sites were a thing, and Angel yeah. Fire, and GeoCities, and all that stuff. I think I had, like, a GeoCities account. I, I had a GeoCities. Re- <laughs> yeah, I, I think I had, like, a paranormal thing. Luckily, it's dead. Long dead, because GeoCities is gone. Um, I also had a website that had Mew 2 on it. Yeah. It was just, like, a... Th- a 3D GIF of Mewtwo. It was really <laughs> weird. I also had on it, like, Who's Ash's Dad? And Speed Racer was one of the choices. So it was Giovanni. Um, and Professor Oak. Oh, God. I think Professor, Professor Oak is probably his dad. Uh, anywho. A year later, seven teens who are absolutely idiots, because they're teens, try to replicate the events of the previous year. Wait, so is this part of the story, or is this something that actually happened? This is a part of the story. Okay. This didn't happen. I tried to Google the, the name that was in it, and I couldn't find it. Okay. So, thinking little of it, six remain inside the bridge, while one, Adrian Hatla, Hat, Hatala, Adrian Hatala had remained a good distance from the bridge, hoping to have enough time to escape if the same thing happened again. So, I Googled Adrian Hatala, and I... Yeah. Literally couldn't find anything on her other than this this story. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean she didn't exist. That just means yeah. the noise that this story produced was too high for me to find any good signal. Okay. Um, but I'm also going to lean towards she doesn't exist. At midnight, she witnessed only this. A dim light walking the railroad track right before midnight. Stopping right above the bridge at midnight. Then disappearing at the same bright flash. Then disappearing at the same as a bright flash was inside the bridge. <laughs> it's really difficult to read it when it's bad grammar. Yeah. Um, she heard the deafening sounds of horrific screams coming from inside the bridge that lasted only seconds. Five seconds later... They were all hung from the edge of the bridge, same style as the corpses a year earlier. Horrified, she ran home. She didn't tell of everything she saw and just splattered splattered words here and there that some of the folks put together to come up with her story. No one understood it or even believed her. They charged her with a murder and locked her up in the Asylum of Lourdes. In 1913, the same thing happened with nine teenagers this time. Halloween night again. It's, so it's just more every time. Yeah. So right now, if you'll you'll remember the counts, we're currently at 18 kills. Yeah. 18 murders. And in this in, this is in the span of seven years? Yeah. Right? Seven? Yeah. This is in the span of, oh, actually, eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Which eight is, years. by the way, almost 17% of the population. Yes. <laughs> Um, Adrian was still locked up. They dropped her sentence, but it was too late. The insanity had finally conquered her. Even if she was released, she was too far gone to have a decent life. So she spent the remaining years in the asylum, the closed asylum, until she finally died in 1953 (laughs) of shock. So, yeah, uh, no record of Adrian, asylum reopened. And why is Adrian arrested? Like, yeah. It's a teenage, like, it says that they dropped her sentence, but why is she being arrested? It kind of seems impossible for her to be the culprit. Like, one person 
murdering six people with a knife, like a crude knife, and then hanging them from the bridge, and it's a teenage girl. Yeah. It just doesn't sound reasonable. And this is 1906. Oh, I, did bad. I did bad math before. You know whatever number I said. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'm definitely overthinking this, this story. There's no doubt in my mind at this point. I realized as I was writing the copy and like taking bits and pieces and doing analysis, I'm like, oh, John, you're doing that thing you do where you overthink things. And you're taking a, a definite work of fiction for serious. <laughs> so more murders would occur. Uh, in 1943, there were six. And now we're at what 24. We at? It was 18. And then we got yeah. six. So we're at 24. 24. 1990, 1973. Uh, 76, sorry. 1976, there were three. So 27. Um, in 1887, there was yet another three. Okay. So we're at 30. Yeah. Um, Janet Chartelier was enjoying the night with her four friends. Halloween night had finally come, and they had gone, driven out. They had... Let me start that again. Janet Chartelier, which is another full name that I couldn't find anything on, uh, in, 18... in 1987, uh, mm -hmm. was enjoying the night with her four friends. Halloween night had finally come, and they had gone driving out to enjoy the night after invading the children's candy bag. Um, they talk a lot about nonsense. Uh, at midnight, until Janet started getting a little scared, she's almost out of the bridge when the lights get really bright <clears throat> inside the bridge. What that When that happens, her body is halfway outside the bridge. She sees her skin start tearing <laughs> at her chest, but nothing is piercing her skin. She manages finally to exit the bridge. Completely horrified, she hits a hanging body, which I don't understand, and knocks herself out. When she awakes, she finds her hair has started turn white, and she has been bleeding. She was lucky that the cut has just started and wasn't very bad at all. She left and never returned to the bridge again. I mean, that's what you get after invading children's candy bags. That, that's all I'm saying. It was actually the children who did it. Um, yeah. She has been seen sitting on a swinging bench on her balcony every morning, just staring in the direction towards the bridge a couple miles down. To this day, you can still find her on that bench every morning. The story ends there, basically. Um, no other incidents are recorded, and the author follows on with a claim that all this is available at the still non-existing Clinton Library. Um, this story does raise a massive question to me, though. Yeah. Why wasn't it national news? Because in because four people dying in 1987 in a tunnel on Halloween night, that's literally in the midst of the satanic panic. That would have triggered oh, yeah. a media blitz. Yeah. <clears throat> it would have been everywhere. And I can't find any references to Janet. Yeah. Well, anywhere, like, on the internet. Serial killers were big. They're famous, right? So why yeah. wouldn't this have been just everywhere? Well, it's not even that it's a serial killer story. It's that it's like a satanic panic story. It has yeah. all the necessary components to be good for that. Because, like, it's – like, they could even spin it as the kids being, like, these devil-worshipping teens. Yeah. Who committed this ritual. Like, it's such a clear candidate for satanic panic, like, and satanic ritual abuse reporting. Yeah. Yeah, that's and if a, a bunch of kids <laughs> pretending, if a bunch of kids saying that they were taken through tunnels to Mexico is a thing that gets believed, then I, or that they were flushing babies down toilets, mm -hmm. then I, I I don't I don't know why a bunch of kids getting hung, hanged in a, a tunnel would have not made national news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's incredibly is. gruesome. The way that this story is described is like brutal. Um, additionally, it's weird to me that the, the link is made between the bunny man and the, these murders, because it's like, why is there a light traveling down the, the railroad tracks? Exa like, yeah. There's, there's nothing in the story of the bunny man to indicate that that would be him. The, no, the only right. thing, the only thing that indicates that it's him is the crude stone tool. Yeah. And then that should be discounted. Um, right, because the one survivor said that the, there was no 
nothing was being used to cause that type of injury. Yeah. Um, so that would rule him out uh, altogether. Yeah. But here's the thing. I don't even know why we're having this conversation. <laughs> because you and I both know that this story is definite bullshit. Yeah. At the very least, it, now, that being said, urban legends tend to have a kernel of truth to them. So maybe there was some event that triggered that, right? So that's when we take a visit to the library. Maybe, yeah. I want to say maybe because now with the internet, it's you, in the advent of creepypasta and all that. Who <laughs> They don't necessarily need to have truth. That That's true, but this is also an urban legend that people have been talking about in the area. Okay. So that's a bit of context that I left out. Um, in Fairfax County – there was talk of a bunny man. Oh, okay. Right? So locally, like, there was a local. Bunnies? Well, it varied, and we're going to get into that. Okay. Um, but the notion is there was talk of a bunny man in mm-hmm. Fairfax County before this story was released. Okay. So the question is, what's that kernel? So Brian A. Conley, our historian activist, or historian activist. <laughs> he is an activist to determining the source of the bunny man. No. Uh-huh. Uh, a historian archivist at the Fairfax County Library flexed his pretty impressive research skills to track down mm-hmm. the source of this legend. Because um, keep in mind, this is before Google was a thing. Yeah. Like, he did this in the early 2000s. So Google's there, but it's, like, kind of useless. Yeah. Because I remember, I remember – basically using different search engines to look for paranormal stuff on the internet. Oh, yeah. He was on that like, hot, hot Alta Vista, and then he was like, oh, man, we've got Dogpile? That's going to be pretty awesome. Oh, Jeeves is looking pretty hot right about now. Oh, yeah. what's this, a new thing called Yahoo? Yahoo? I almost never used Yahoo. Yeah, me neither. I used Dogpile I a lot. Well, now it's Google, but I used to use Dogpile a lot. Oh, was was Google Dogpile originally? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe? They might have been purchased. Uh, anywho, so um, he really wanted to figure out what the source of the legend was because he thought, okay, most urban legends grow from a kernel of truth. So he decided to set about finding the initial seed. Um, through the use of a newspaper index of the area, he was able to narrow down the seed event to one of three potential murders. And now, we're not a true crime podcast. Nope. So I'm going to tell you about these. Yeah. If you're interested in the stories, you can read the article, which is linked. Oh, okay. Be- because we don't talk about true crime as a rule, uh, I just don't want to bog down the episode talking about three distinct murders, and I wouldn't be able to give justice to those murders in the first place. Mm-hmm. So um, the three events were the murder of Francis and June Holliber by their husband slash father, because it was a mother-daughter getting murdered, um, in 1949. Uh, the murder of Loretta and Catherine Ridgway, which were two children, in 1927. And the murder of Ava Roy in 1913. Um, however, Conley determined that none of the three murders were good fits for the origin story because the capture of the culprit in the first two would have ruled them out. Um, and the age of the last one was mm-hmm. simply too old for the legend to really exist in the area. Yeah. Um, based on what he was saying and the note, the notion, the nature of the crimes didn't really match up. But like I said before, if you're interested in those stories, uh, feel free to read. Um, the story had evolved over time, though. Um, the Forbes version had like around 30 deaths in a profound supernatural quality to it. Yeah. In the ni- in the 80s, victims were largely children. And numbered mm. one to three because uh, it turns out Conley had been listening to this story since the 80s. Right? Oh, okay. So he had found a few sources. Um, and in those sources, he said, okay, largely children are the victims. Mm-hmm. And largely these victims number in like, you know, the ones to threes. So not as wide scaled as the original stories. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm going to quote him. The earliest versions recount acts of vandalism or couples parked at secluded lover lane type locations, um, hmm. being accosted slash threatened by a strange individual dressed in a white bunny costume. So uh, in the article, he said that those earliest stories were some from sometime around uh, 1970. And 
if you're at all interested in urban legends, you know about Lover's Lane stories. Yeah. Um, because they're, 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 you know, cautionary tales made by adults, made by other kids. You know, just, it's one of those, like, I, I had the, I, I would love to do an episode on Lover Lane, Lover, mm-hmm. Lover's Lanes. Uh, I'm just thinking of the fact that that's the name of your, your podcast. <laughs> um, I'd love to do an episode talking about like the origin of those types of stories and why they're so prevalent in our culture. Um, I think it has something to do with like the taboo mm-hmm. of it, and things that are taboo tend to be a little spicier. Um, but incidentally, uh, there was a, stu- a study that was carried out by one Patricia Johnson a student at the University of Maryland in 1973, and it was titled The Bunny Man. Uh, Unfortunately, I couldn't find the original source because, for whatever reason, the University of Maryland's uh, publication search bar is not functioning. Uh Uh, Uh-huh. But at the end of the day, Conley uh, reproduced some of the key points, and I looked into his sources, and he's he's got some pretty decent sources overall. So I'm willing to say... Okay, I'm going to trust his research and his reproduction of this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do want to, you know, put a caution warning in that because unfortunately I don't have the original source. Mm-hmm. So, uh, a rough analysis of the 54 stories that were gathered by Patricia indicates several uh, key threads. Um, there were 14 different geographic locations mentioned, 18 of the stories. Involved the bunny man chasing frightened people, usually children, with a hatchet or axe. Fourteen of the stories talk about attacks on cars. Um, Nine claim he had attacked a couple parked in a car, so the lover's lanes type story. Mm -hmm. Um, Five accused him of vandalism on homes or buildings. And only three mentioned murder. Oh, okay. So this is in 1973. Yeah. So uh, because there's so much variation in these stories, like, I mean... 14 different geographic locations is a lot Yeah, for an urban legend. Uh, Patricia determined that the Bunny Man was an urban legend, which indicates that it's a non-existent thing. I think mm-hmm. uh, urban belief was the exact term that they used in the article. Um, yeah. So effectively what that means is, okay, based on a meta-analysis of folklore and uh, rumor, we can say – with decent certainty that this thing doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, or if it does exist, it doesn't exist in the way that people understand it. So, uh, our intrepid researcher realized after reading through this story, which is like eight years into his research process that he found, found this. Shoot. Um, the first instance of the tale that Patricia's research uh, outlined occurred in 1970, which led him to two articles by the Washington Post. Okay. So, it turns out there was a seed event. Oh, okay. Uh, Man in bunny suit sought in Fairfax, Fairfax, October 19th, 1970, Washington Post. Fairfax County Police said yesterday that they are looking for a man who likes to wear a white bunny rabbit costume and throw hatchets through car windows no shit Honest. like while they're driving or when they're like parked well we're gonna get into that uh air force academy cadet robert bennett told police that shortly after midnight last sunday he and his fiance were sitting in a car on the 5400 block of guinea road where were you two doing when a man <laughs> dressed in a white suit with long bunny ears ran from the nearby bushes and shouted you're on private property I'll have your tag number. <laughs> like, this is next level old man uh, polishing his shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> um, the rabbit threw a wooden handled hatchet through the front, uh, the right front car window. The first year cadet told police. As soon as he threw the hatchet, the rabbit skipped off into the night. <laughs> Oh, Bennett shit. and his fiance were not injured. <laughs> Holy shit! Police say they have the hatchet, but no other clues in the case. 
They say Bennett was visiting an uncle who lives across the street from the spot where the car was parked. The cadet was in the area to attend last weekend's Armed Air Force Navy football game. Um, <laughs> and to make things better, there's a picture on the Wikipedia for this story yeah. of the hatchet, which I've added to the show notes. Oh, I've added to the, the copy. Yeah. Um, and you can't really see it in the copy, but there's a bronze plaque that says, Our Hair Raising Adventure. Oh no! <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's supposed it's supposed to be the original hatchet from that event. Yeah, that's which, the worst. This is an amazing story. I love this. I mean, it's it's hair raising for sure. Yeah. Uh, but like, no one was injured. No one was hurt. Uh, it, it's it's exactly the kind of story that I love to read because it's just so bizarre. Yeah. Um. Although I. I'm a little concerned about the fact that, like, what was that rabbit's endgame? The rabbit man's endgame? That, I don't know. Right? Because it wasn't, I think he just wanted <laughs> to throw a hatchet at a car and then skip away. I think so, too. But, hey, guess what? Ten days later, the bunny man strikes again. Oh! Yeah. The rabbit reappears, October 29th, 1970. A man wearing a furby, furry rabbit suit with two long ears appeared again on guinea road in fairfax county thursday night police reported this time wielding an axe and chopping away at a roof support on a new house (laughs) so there's the vandalism bit yeah Um, less than two weeks ago a man wearing what was described as a rabbit suit accused uh accused two persons in a parked car of trespassing and heaved a hatchet through a closed window of the car uh, at 5400 Giddy Road. They were not hurt. Thursday's night, Rabbit Attack, wearing a suit described as gray, black, and white, was spotted a block away at 5307 Guinea Road. I so, love that this implies he has multiple rabbit suits. <laughs> it either implies this ha- that, that uh, this guy has multiple rabbit suits, or there's more than one person who said, yeah, I'm going to buy a rabbit suit and I'm going to go and terrorize people. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Paul Phillips, a private security guard for a new construction company, said he saw the rabbit standing on the front porch of a new but unoccupied house. I started talking to him, Phillips said, and that's when he started chopping. All you people are (laughs) trespass around here, Phillips said the rabbit told him as he whacked eight gashes into the pole. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to bust you on the head. (laughs) Uh, Phillips said he walked back to his car to get his handgun but the rabbit carrying the long handled axe ran off into the woods the the security guard said the man was about 5 feet 8 160 pounds and appeared to be in his early 20s okay did they ever catch him Um, so the article that I found the the bunny man on mask which Really, this this read this this episode is more or less a condensed version of that. Okay. Uh, they did perform a uh, they did perform a uh, police investigation. Uh, however, they were unable to really find him. Um, reading, I, I I forgot to put this in the show notes, but uh, basically the idea is a bunch of kids to describe seeing him after the fact. Okay. And he was just being weird in general. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Johnson interviewed his son, age eight, and eventually they learned he had not actually met the bunny man, but only heard of the bunny man at school from the rest of the children talking about him. So it's one of those weird things where, like, I gotcha. school legend kind of put yeah. his boots on and ran with it. Uh, the case was marked as inactive, and they never really found out who the person was, as far uh-huh. as I can tell. Um,. After a very extensive investigation of this and all the other cases of the same nature, it is still unsubstantiated as to whether or not there really is a white rabbit. Um, because the first incident was, uh, let's see. Yeah, the first incident was not reported, um, but they do have an investigation report of the October 29th vandalism incident, although they're not required to release any information related to misdemeanor offenses. So basically what that reads as is I guess they didn't file a police report for the first one and the yeah. second one they did and because it's a misdemeanor they don't have to really do a whole lot with it. Um, okay. Unfortunately there's no known identity of the bunny man. 
huh. Um, I also couldn't find a concrete example, like a concrete clipping of that second article. So yeah. I'm reproducing what was in the first article I found. So it is a secondary, secondhand source. So just keep that in mind as I read that. Um, but I hate you. Uh, <laughs> so the key takeaway of this, though, is in three years time, the story had already mutated into what 14 different geographic locations yeah so many different permutations of the story there were some murders involved there was vandalism there was menacing people and then you know 30 years later over 30 years later it's now become this story that has supernatural elements there's a asylum that's incorporated it's the key takeaway is urban legend is extremely extremely uh powerful yeah you know rumor rumor mongering is powerful this mm -hmm. is this is something I, was, I mentioned last week on the uh the almost episode right mm -hmm. where a story gets contorted and modified so quickly in such a short period of time because just think about like the game of telephone right yeah even hearing a story you're not going to be able to reproduce it mm -hmm. correctly every time you tell it like, even when I tell you this story, even though I have copy in front of me, I've modified parts of the story and I don't even know it. Yep. Right? I've added my own twist to the story. I've mm -hmm. mutated the story in a different way. I've given you a new way of looking at the story, a new, new dynamic. Even if mine is based largely off of Conley's research, in talking about his research, I've added the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's how urban legends work. It's a big yes and yeah yeah um and i hate the fact that you put a picture of frank from donnie darko at the bottom of this. <laughs> yep <laughs> check off's gun man we talked about it you hating it in the first act i had to put a picture of it somewhere you're not wrong it had to be there yeah but I mean, I, I've also read, I don't know, I feel like I've heard about Bunny Man Bridge in different locations, too. Like, I remember reading a weird U.S. article years ago about it being, like, different states and stuff like that. So, but I think that's largely a uh, thing spread, right? Yeah. Like, remember the creepy clowns from 2016 that no one talks about for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. That was a weird thing that just ex existed everywhere. Yeah. For a while. Um, additionally, the, whatchamacallit, the, the, the Pope Lick monster, right? Mm -hmm. And the goat man, they have like really weird similarities to this story. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't really want to incorporate them into this because I still think I can probably get a full episode of the Pope Lick monster and talking about it. Oh At yeah. At the very least, probably. there's a full episode talking about that movie. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, the, structurally, this urban legend matches a lot of other urban legends. Mm -hmm. right um most most road urban legends like the thing that happens on the road they have this like structural quality to them that they all kind of internally resemble each other and i find that fascinating like truly fascinating um although i don't really i find it weird because we live in an area with a lot of history yeah. But I don't really know of any kind of fuck wild urban legends from our area. There, I think we've got some. Just none come to mind uh, at the moment. But I'm yeah. sure I've, I've, I have to have heard heard some of them before. Yeah. I mean, also, the time that you hear an urban legend affects your in, the influence on you. Like, I heard about this urban legend back in the, like, back in the early 2000s when I read the original thing. Right? So... As a result, it has a different impact on me. But ultimately, I have nothing else to talk about the Buddy Man, and I'm just vamping. Um, I was gonna try to share some disturbing images for you, but uh, the thir the 34th rule does not apply to Donnie Darko. Apparently, I highly doubt that. I don't think you're. You don't you're think Google I'm good Foo. enough? No, I don't <laughs> think your Google Foo's there. Give me a second. Uh. We can cut this down if you want. I don't care. <laughs> but, uh, oh, 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 I found Donatello. 
Donatello, Donatello is not Donnie Darko. Yeah, I also found Donnie Thornberry, and that, that link is going to say blue. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I found some. I couldn't really find anything. I found, like, uh, it's mostly just flash it's mostly break. It's mostly just regular stuff with, uh, uh, with Frank in the background. Also, there's this, which I think this is the most disturbing thing, and I'm going to end the episode with your reaction to this i think Ooh, i'm excited don't threaten me with a good time why is this not pasting man this is great audio oh yeah there you go let's see Oh, just said John is typing, and then, oh, and now there's a link that's clickable, so I shall click on it. There's a flash. And, oh, wow. That's mm -hmm. exciting. That's, someone went to art school. Oh, You're boy. implying that they, they, they imply, you're implying that uh, they went, they actually went to arts, art school. That's, I mean... Like if you cover if you if I cover the bottom with my hand, then that's like a really terrifying picture. And then if I cover the top with my hand, it's it's a poorly drawn picture. But if I cover the bottom and look at just the head, then it's terrifying. <laughs> like it is scary. It is terrifying. Um, you also left out a very important uh, character from Donnie Darko, the sequel movie, in your searching. I have... Oh wait, wow, huh, huh? I'm amazed. So, I think I found it. What? I think I found the one thing on the internet that the 34th rule doesn't apply to. What is it? Donnie Darko? No. Samantha Darko. <laughs> Anywho, um, let's see. Plugs, plugs, plugs. Okay, yeah, as always, uh, if you want to visit our website, we're cryptopediacast.com. Our Instagram is at cryptopediacast. Our Twitter, also at cryptopediacast. If you want to email us, it's cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. There's a Patreon. A uh, bunch of things you get with that. I uh, should be uploading. Uh, I think we'll upload the short story podcast you did. Nice. Next. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it? 10 Lilyfield Lane. Something like that. Yeah. Um, we have a Facebook group where we post stuff too. Uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, rate, review, subscribe. Um, Perform any rituals that you need to get us noticed. Uh, if you have any monster requests or stories, send them our way. It can be hard finding monsters every week, every other week. Uh, if you have any creepypasta or cryptopasta, I promise you uh, I'll consider reading it. <laughs> you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon. Uh, if you want to get in contact with me on Twitter, I'm at mu2057. Oh, nope. Nope. I misread that and I <laughs> broke my brain. If you want to view my pictures of cats and other stupid things I take pictures of, um, because everything other than cats is stupid, my Instagram is at mu2057. Uh, my Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website, functional, but some playable games, is johndunhamgames.com. And you can email me at john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. And his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. I'm John. I'm Brandon. And if you start looking for the 34th rule, things are definitely weird. <laughs>